came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groanings Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. Somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Good morning. Welcome to our services online. Uh, welcome to the sixth Sunday and day 39 of the Babylonian captivity of First Baptist Church of Burton. We hope to be able to meet together soon whenever it will be safe to do so. As long as cases continue to increase in our area, we will continue to maintain our worship and our prayer together uh, over the Internet. And we thank the Lord that he's given us this means to be able to do so, to stay close together spiritually and visually as well. So we thank the Lord for you. Thank the Lord for you um, gathering together this morning to worship as our church family. Thank you for those who are beyond our family. Thank you for joining us as well. We pray this will be a blessing to you. If you are in this area and you don't have a church home, we invite you to come to uh, the best church in the world, uh, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, here in Burton. And uh, we miss all of you. Can't wait to see you again. So let's worship the Lord together this morning. Time for pastor's pals. Uh, so uh, adults, move away from the front of the screen. I know that you really enjoy this part of our service as well, but this is really intended for the children, the pastor's pals. So boys and girls, come on down. I hope you all are doing fine at home and your school work is going on okay. Miss y'all. I miss seeing you here on the front pew every Sunday morning. And uh, I'm sure you miss us and miss the Sunday school class. Uh, we're at Pastor's Pals. We're kind of giving you a Sunday school class as well as uh, talking to you about the Lord and spending time together. Uh, of course, our pastor's pals are uh, Austin and Adam, Connor and Emery, Brandon and Jessica. And uh, if anybody else wants to join us, there's room. We've, we have a lot of guests that come and sit here on the front pew. So we invite you to come as well. Uh, there's still room on the front pew for you. So this morning, um, even though I can't ask you about your Sunday school class, I can ask you if you have been following the pastor's pals and you've been following the events that have been in the book of Genesis so far. And by the way, not only am I greeting my pastor's pals, but I'm greeting my pastor's pilots. You see, when you graduate from pastor's pals in the sixth grade, you become a pastor pilot. The pastor's pilots uh, are those who are steering their way through high school and 
some to college in order to uh, prepare to serve the Lord with your life. So uh, I have uh, quite a following and lots of friends and lots of buddies, lots of pals, and now pilots to go. So I'm glad you're here with us this morning. And I want to uh, move now from the Tower of Babel. If you remember, we looked at creation. We looked at the fall, how sin came into our lives. Then we saw how uh, sin manifested itself. It got big and grew until the whole world was, had turned their back on God in rebellion, and God had to send the flood in judgment of people who had turned their back on him. And then uh, the judgment at the Tower of Babel, when again people turned their back and rebelled against what the Lord had told them to do. And he confused their languages. Everyone was speaking a different language so that they could not come together in their rebellion against the Lord. And uh, so the Lord sends everybody away into different parts of the world. And he goes then to one man. Just like he went to one man, to Adam, and created him in the very beginning. Then in a new beginning, he went to one man, Noah. And then now here's a third beginning. He goes to one man named Abram. And uh, in chapter 12 of Genesis, it said that the Lord said to Abram, now Abram is the same as Abraham. Uh, God changes his name later on. He said, get out of your country. Leave your country. Leave your kinfolks. Leave all of your relatives. Leave your father and your father's house and all of the possessions and go to a land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. So all of the people in the world turned their back on God, and God stopped speaking to them. And he only spoke to one man, to Abram, and to his descendants, which became the children of Israel and the nation of Israel. And so he promises Abram here that he's going to make him a great nation. He said, I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. And you, yourself, Abram, are going to be a blessing to others. And he said, I'll bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that curses you. And in you shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. Well, can you imagine what that would be like to be there in your own country going about your business? Wait a minute. I, I think we've got a, a guest here with us. Uh, do we have a guest here anywhere? Oh, I think I hear him, boys and girls. Let's go see who it is. Oh, my goodness. This is, this is a strange-looking fella. Uh, good, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, boy, you look all the way down like you're fixing I've, to go I've, on I've, a trip. I've been traveling. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you going to ask my name first? Would your name... Don't get ahead of me. Okay. <clears throat> Would your name just happen to be Abram? Yes, sir. That's my name. I thought Abram. that's who... I, I, I'm, I'm from Ur of the Chaldees. From Ur of the Chaldees. That's, that's in Chaldea, isn't it? Chaldea, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and so you, you look all the way down like I, you're going to go on a trip. I got all this... Baggage that I'm carrying. I got my duffel bag with my clothes in it. I got my computer bag to take with me so I can keep up to date. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, computer, computer bag. Okay, so we were just reading um, about you. Yes, sir. And uh, so, so I don't have steel toe boots on, so <laughs> be careful. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't start anything if I were you. <clears throat> um, so anyway, uh, as I was uh, talking to the boys and girls, 
you were in your country just yes, minding your own business and, and the Lord appeared to you. Yes, sir. Sure did. Wow. And he spoke to you. Yes, sir. But, you know, he speaks to us too. Yes, sir. Uh, he speaks to us from his word. Yes, sir. Okay. It's great, isn't it? Oh, it's just, it's wonderful. It's a great book. It, it is. I haven't uh, got it yet. Uh, well, but, you're, you're getting it in bits and pieces. Yes, sir. You're only up to chapter 12 so far. Well, we got a long way to go. We got a long way to long go. Years to go. <laughs> but, yes, sir. But I understand that uh, he said something to you. He said for you to leave your yes. your your kin folks, leave all your of family. your relatives, all of your father yes, and your father's house, uh, uh, all of those possessions that uh, you and your brothers have. Yes, sir. And leave and just go to a place that he's going to lead you. Never been there before. Don't even know where I'm Don't going. know where you're going Don't until... Know. And now, when you started off, the Lord revealed to you that it was Canaan. Canaan. told me it was Canaan. Yes, Canaan. Sir. Now, that's the complete opposite side of the world from you. Now, oh, Lord. Yes, here's Ur over on this uh -huh. side. Uh -huh. If you can picture a clock, Ur would be 3 o'clock. Ur at 3 o'clock. Yeah. Now, way over here. 9 o'clock. Is, is it, very good. Is Canaan and Canaan's at nine o'clock. Oh, not wow. Yeah, and halfway at noon is Haran. Yes, sir. And it's interesting that it's the same name as your one, one, one of my, your brothers. My, my brother, that, yeah. and I understand he passed he away. Passed away. Yes. yes sir. Well, that's I'm I'm sad, but he had a son named Lot. Lot. I take care of Lot now. And and and, and so I, I raised I raised Lot as my own son. I understand. I understand. That's uh, I, I'm sure Lot looks at you yes, as sir. a father. And by the way, boys and girls, did you know that his name Abram means father? Oh, yes, sir. That's what my name means. Uh -huh. Father. Yeah. Father. Abr Abram. Abram. And uh, a, a short name for that, a nickname for that is Abba. Abba. That would be like saying dad instead of father. So, yes, so yeah, a lot so calls Abram. me dad. Yeah, he says Abba probably Abba. a lot, but everybody else says Abram or father. So whenever anybody calls you, they're saying father. Yes, sir. Yeah, you, father. You could call me dad. But now, I, I hate to bring this up to you, yes. but it's got to be a little embarrassing to be called father and not have any children. Now, I understand well, your wife, Sarai, uh, she's, cannot uh, have children. No, she can't have children. And but so see, everybody that calls you father have got to go smirk, smirk when they do so. Yeah, well, are, are you are you doing okay with that? I'm okay because of something that when God talked to me, yes. he told me something. Oh. He would make my seed as the mo as the sand on the seashore and as the stars wow. in the sky. He told me that I would be a father of nations. Whoa. Of of multitudes. Multitudes. Wow. So So I don't know well, how I, promise. I don't know how he's going to do that since my wife is barren; she can't have kids. Yeah, I don't know how he's going to do that, but, but I you, know you just trust the Lord. He, he he said that's what he would do. Now, you know what that's called? That's called faith. Faith. And what we understand is that everything about your life has to do oh, with just, with faith. Just, yes, just what I sure. I have to adjust this. It does look kind of heavy. Heavy load. Yeah. Now, you're okay. on your way to Canaan, and uh, uh, you, you, you've, had, you've got all of your possessions. Everything. you got your father got and everything. My fa and my father. But and now, Abram, hang on just a second. I thought that you said God said for you to leave your relatives and your fathers and all yeah. that. And here you've got all this baggage here, and you've got this big old suitcase there yes, sir. on your back. It's got to be heavy, doesn't it? It's very heavy. Very heavy. As a matter of fact, if you didn't have that staff, you'd probably fall, well, I fall over backwards. I have, you know. to lean. Yeah. See, I have to lean over. Yeah, don't yeah. lean over too, like too much. Heavy. I don't know what's underneath that robe there. Yeah, but anyway. Um, We're safe. Yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's good, bro. That's, thank you for that assurance. Uh, but, but anyway... So here's here's a person, and I don't mean to 
point out your faults or anything, but here's, here's a man right here that everything about you is associated with faith. So what, you know what that tells me? What's that? Abram, is that faith is something that has to be learned. You receive faith, but then you have to exercise it and use it. And uh, so uh, in not using it, you're going to learn a pretty valuable lesson. Okay? Yes, sir. So uh, if you want to go, go back now, I think uh, you're almost to Haran. So if you'll go there and check and make sure that's Haran in there, just it's probably just on the other side of that door right there. Yep, I think I think that's, that's it. it. I that's see the Haran. city limit sign. It says Haran. Okay, so uh, we'll talk to you in just a minute. Okay, uh, and so we'll we'll let you get settled and everything there, and uh, get your your dad looks pretty sick to me. I don't look like he can make it much further. Maybe y'all can stop and, and rest there for just a minute before you, you continue on to Canaan. So boys and girls, what happened is that uh, Abram did follow the Lord, but not completely. Uh, he took everybody with him. He took all of the possessions. Uh, he had his brother Nahor and his wife and family he had his uh, deceased brother's family. Uh, he had his nephew Lot with him, and he had his dad, had all that possessions and stuff. And uh, they're on their way to Canaan, but they get here to Haran, and instead of just a stopover, they end up staying. And uh, while they're there, I understand that Abram's father, Terah, passes away. And uh, they've learned a hard lesson here in Haran. And uh, Abram, are you still there? I'm still here. All right. Are you are you about to leave now? We've time to go. Okay. Well, don't let me get here in your way. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You you look a whole lot lighter. Yes, sir. I don't see any baggage or any well, suitcases or anything. God says time to go on. Get where he called me to go. Oh, and uh, like he originally he said, said to said, go. And I tell he said, I told you, don't take your family. I just want you to go. And and so I'm sorry to hear that your father has yes, passed he away. Two hundred and five years old. Uh, lived a, lived a good life, yes, didn't he? Yes. And um, your brother, uh, your your brother, he decided to stay he, here. He's going to stay here, and his and family, I'm, and yeah, I'm assuming most of the possessions are going to stay here. Gonna You're going to take some well, with God, you. God said you need to go, and I'll take care of everything you need. He'll provide. He'll provide. And so you're just trusting completely in Him, then, yes, right? Sir. Amen. Amen. And uh, so you have Sarai, your wife, All and right. you have Lot, your nephew, and just have just enough really just to, enough to, to get by get there and he'll provide all the way on the way and so now you're on your way to Canaan CCC where uh, where God uh, uh, uh-huh uh, yeah where God guides God provides amen I like that for uh, now let me get this where God guides God he provide. provides. He provides. he provides I like that so uh, so the boys and girls, Whenever the Lord tells them something, they don't need to doubt it. They That's need right. to put all of their trust in Him. He'll verify it by His Word. Yes. Yes. Amen. It's just, it's been a delight to meet it's you. It's been a joy Abram. to be here. And I'm sure the boys sure and girls. We'll meet again. Yeah. I, I'm sure the boys and girls now have a mental image of what Abram looks like. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> it'd be pretty close anyway. <laughs> well, I'm not going to. Uh, uh, keep you any longer. I know okay. you're in a hurry to get to where God told you. Yes, sir. So you, I got to go to nine o'clock. Uh, that's right. That's right. All right. Thank you very much. So, boys and girls, uh, when the Lord tells you to do something, don't go halfway. Go all the way, and the Lord will bless. When the Lord tells you to do something, He'll provide the way and the means for that to take place. All right. Well. Thank you.
Abram, it was good to meet you, and, and maybe we'll get to see you next week and find out a little bit more about you. All right, let's pray. Boys and girls, I pray that you would listen very attentively to the voice of the Lord. Boys and girls, would you right now bow your heads, close your eyes, and hear the voice of God in His Word as He calls to you. Maybe some of you have not yet received the Lord into your life as Savior. Maybe right now you'd like to open your heart and invite the Lord to come in to your heart and to your life and be your Savior and be your Lord and follow Him as His servant Abram did. Now, Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the example and for the life of Abram, who became Abraham, your servant. Your word declares him to be your friend. Lord, we thank you that you have invited us into your family as your children. Thank you for the boys and girls. Lord, thank you for their love for you their love for your word. Bless them now. Watch over them during this time and draw them especially closer to you. Reassure them to where they will not be afraid. And may they look to you for wisdom and for guidance all the days of their life. I dedicate them to you. I put them into your hands and into your keeping. And for all of the youth that have grown and are in school and uh, starting their careers and their service to you. I pray that you would especially watch over them, take care of them from all of the dangers that uh, the world uh, is tempting them with. Lord, keep them safe. Keep them safe from temptation and from evil. And Lord, may they serve you all the days of their life. Now bless the service, we pray with your presence. In Jesus' name.
one more of our virtual services. Um, praise God that we're able to do this, and I want to thank all the guys that, that help with this, and um, just miss all of you guys out there. I know that you guys are watching this, uh, this video and, and this sermon, and tomorrow morning you'll be watching it with your family, and um, we, just, we just miss you all, and I, I tell you what, maybe when we uh, get back into the swing of things, we just have a big fellowship with the whole church family, and yeah. Yeah. And and get together. So, Easter. yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. Easter's coming. So, so guys, um, would you please go with um, go, to, go into prayer with me right now, Lord God? Um, we come to you today and pray for all of those who have been sick and stricken by this virus, Lord God. And not only that, Lord, all the the sickness that's out there, uh, Lord. Uh, we especially lift up Andy and Miss Joan and and. All of those who have had sickness, Lord, I, I haven't heard from Miss Cheryl and, and Miss Julie in a while, so Lord, uh, we lift those up to you as well. And Miss Jenny, Lord God, we know that um, those those guys are always on our prayer list, and we just lift them up to you, Lord. Lord, uh, today we lift up our community to you, Lord, as, as one facility has had so many virus uh, confirmed cases, Lord, and um, Lord, it's it's also increased uh, the amount of deaths in our community, Lord God, and it's it's put us on a radar, basically in our state, Lord. And Lord, I just I just pray that um, the healthcare workers that have come in to help with that facility uh, can slow the slow the spread and and save those folks' lives, Lord God, that are that are in harm's way, Lord. And Lord. Uh, all the healthcare workers, all the public safety folks, everyone who's helping in this. And, and Lord, we also lift up our leaders um, on the local, state, and federal level, especially our president, Lord God, as we go through all of this. And uh, Lord, we're in uncharted territory, and we know that it's not our will that's going to be done. It's your will, Lord God. And Lord, we're just praying for that will be done. And Lord, we just lift that up to you today, Lord. And we lift our pastor up to you today, Lord, as he's got a sermon laid on his heart. And Lord, I just hope that um, each and every one of us that hear this sermon and take time uh, to spend time with our family as we listen to this sermon and watch this sermon on our TVs, Lord, that, that we go live this out in, in our true lives, the message that's been laid on his heart. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just remember, God's still on the throne. His will has not changed. His word is always right. And prayer always increases our faith. So we're going to sing a song this morning. Also, when we live by faith, that increases our trust in him. It increases our desire to be with him and to walk with him. 
So we need to keep living by faith, keep our eyes in his word, keep our, our knees down on, in prayer, and he's going to take care of everything. He'll be with us all the way through this one. All right. Living by faith. offering on the last verse. I care not today what tomorrow may bring. It's sunshine and sunshine and rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above Trusting, confiding in his great love. Above all, safe in his sheltering arms. Living by faith and feels all along. No tempest may blow and Storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The master looks on at the strife. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. In his sheltering arms, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. I know that he will safely carry me through, no matter what evil betides. Should I then care through the tongue that may blow? If Jesus walks close by my side, living by faith in Jesus above, trusting and finding in his great love, the Lord say in his sheltering take our Bibles in your living rooms there if you would would you stand please as we read God's word Luke chapter 16 we're going to read uh, the first 15 verses of Luke and then we'll have the men come for the offering when we get to the end on verse 1 and he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward. And the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship. They re may receive me into their houses. 
So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou to my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said unto another, How much owest, owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is, is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that we have to come and fellowship and worship, but it's, we're doing it without our people. We're doing it here without all the ones we love and miss. And it's just not the same. We wish they were here. So we pray, dear God, that soon you'll work it out where we can meet back together again in this place for Sunday worship, for Sunday night service, for our Sunday afternoon dinners, for our Wednesday night prayer meeting, for our Saturday men's meeting and our Sunday evening women's meeting. Please bless, dear God, where we can be back together. Build a hedge about our people, dear God, and take care of them. Keep us safe in your arms. Help us to see you doing the work that needs to be done in our lives. And help us to recognize God is doing his work. God is doing his will. God is still on the throne. And God is taking care of us. Bless today. Bless our preacher. Fill him, dear God, with your Holy Spirit to give us the message that we need to hear as a church. As First Baptist Burton. And would you use it, Lord, even to speak to those who aren't a part of our church. Give us what we need to hear. Take the offerings and bless them today. Bless our missionaries. Meet the needs that they have. Meet the needs that we have here at this church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord loves a cheerful giver. What a blessing to be able to give. Amen. Here's another great old song we've learned to love, love around here. It's, a, it's an older song, but it has a great message. It's called The Lifeboat. I'm going to tell you right now, folks, mm -hmm. there's a boat coming yeah, to take his church home, mm -hmm. to take his bride home. Mm -hmm. But you can't get on board that boat unless you've got the ticket. <laughs> Brother, the ticket's been paid. <laughs> the blood's been shed. We don't have to pay for the ticket. It's paid for. Jesus paid the price. Amen. 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 Ready? We're ready. Well, it's coming. <laughs>
Then let us all take courage, for we're not left alone. The life of soon is coming to gather his children home. Then cheer, my brother, cheer, our trials will soon be o'er. Loved ones we shall meet, shall meet upon the golden shore. We're pilgrims and we're strangers, we're seeking a city to come. The life of soon is coming to gather his children home. Sometimes the devil tempts me and says it's all in vain. I to live the Christian life and walk in Jesus' name. But then we hear the Master say, I'll lend you a helping hand. And if you'll only trust me, hey, then cheer, my brother, cheer. Our trials will soon be o'er. Our loved ones we shall meet, shall meet upon the golden shore. We're pilgrims and we're strangers. We're seeking a city to come. Life will soon is coming to gather his children home. The life of the soon is coming by the eye of faith I see. As she sweeps through the waters to rescue you and me. And land us safely in the port with friends we love so dear. Get ready, cries the captain, oh look she's almost here. The life of soon is coming. Amen, Brother Gary. I like that song. Lifeboat soon is coming. And yeah, the fare is paid. But you still have to get on the boat. I hope one of my best friends in the whole world, Brother W.A., is listening. And I think about uh, him every time I hear that song. He's a dear, dear brother. I love him much in the Lord and pray for him. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles to the book of Judges. Judges chapter number 17. Judges 17. What a blessing to have this book. What a blessing to realize that God has not left us without his word. He has not left us without His presence. He's given us His Word. He's given us His Spirit to indwell us and to open our eyes to this book. Judges chapter 17. There was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee about which thou cursed and spoke of also in my ears. 
Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took two hundred shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a house of gods, and he made an ephod and a teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We return to the days of the judges. The 400 years between Moses and David, where 12 individuals were raised up by the Lord to lead and to deliver his people out of the seven cycles of apostasy and repentance and revival. We still see it today. It happens all the time. It happens to nations. It happens to churches. happens to individuals. happens to homes over and over, the same cycle. It begins by... Uh, For a nation, it begins by destroying and abandoning the Bible. Then by abandoning the church. Then by abandoning marriage in the home. And then by abandoning, finally, the government and the authority of the government. That's how a nation falls. The authority of God and His Word is not only not recognized today, but it's ridiculed. Every man becomes his own authority. Every man decides for himself what's right and what's wrong. There's no compass with a true north anymore. We've lost our way. We've lost our direction. We've lost our ability to live right and to do right. There's no fixed point of right and wrong. Micah and his times, we saw from verse 1, they were perilous times. I can quote Charles Dickens here at the beginning of A Tale of Two Cities. It was the worst of times, it was the best of times. They were times of defeat and failure. There were times of repentance and renewal, but they only lasted for one generation, and then the cycle repeated itself. For some reason, they could not pass along to the next generation their love for God and their love for His Word. Then came the return to sin and disobedience, followed by the defeat and by the failure. The church has to find our voice again in these times. The government can never replace the church as a moral voice. Education can never produce righteousness. Wealth can never produce joy. Covetousness and materialism can never produce contentment. A romantic human relationship can never produce love. All of those things can only be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is that message today? In the few places that you can hear it, out in the wilderness... Nobody's listening. And they don't want to hear it. I believe then the Lord Himself begins to silence the church. The remnant church. He no longer calls and raises up young men 
to proclaim the truth of God's Word. When's the last time your church had an ordination service and ordained a young man to the gospel ministry? There was a time when the world turned their back on God and God turned His back on them and sent a flood of judgment. And He only spoke to one man, Noah. There was another time when the world again turned their back on God in rebellion against Him and He confused their languages and then He didn't speak anymore for 2,000 years except to one man and his descendants, Abraham and the nation of Israel. For 2,000 years, the majority of the world did not hear the voice of God until the cross of Jesus Christ came. And now the Lord speaks for 2,000 years since to anyone who will have ears to hear and have eyes to see. He speaks to it through His Word from the cross. Come unto Me. The false prophets begin to multiply. Confusion, chaos, uncertainty becomes the order of the day. Then defeat and failure. I'm afraid I don't see a great turning to the Lord yet in this coronavirus epidemic, this pestilence. I pray it will still happen though. I pray every day that somehow through this the Lord would get glory and that people would turn to Him in repentance and in salvation and that His people would wake up and see that the time's short. Instead, I see more of a turning to the government and a demanding for money and food and a cure and a solution. Micah and his times are awful close to our times today. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. Then we've been looking at Micah and his mother, Verse 2, and uh, Micah, he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursed, and spake of also in my ears. Behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Her character comes shining through. Here in this verse, she wakes up one morning and immediately goes to her secret hiding place to pull out her bags of silver and look at those coins. What's the first thing that we do when we wake up? What's the first thing we pick up into our hands and look at? Who's the first person that we speak to when we wake up in the morning? Is it the Lord? Or is it Siri? She does this first thing. She looks at those coins proudly. She handles them. She puts them then carefully back into the bags and back into the safe and secure hiding place where she keeps it. And she thinks about them during the day. She glances over there at that hiding place and she receives a little comfort, a little reassurance. Everything's okay. When she's nervous or upset about something, she sets her mind on those silver coins. It calms her. It reassures her. It gives her a sense of security 
that if anything should happen, she's prepared. Oh, how her and her late husband skimped and saved and sacrificed to these bags. But then one morning, the unthinkable happens. She goes to her secret hiding place. And she notices that things are disturbed and moved around. They're not where they normally are. And then to her horror, she discovers that her money is gone. The bags are empty. No! Somebody stole her God. Her blood pressure begins to rise. Her pulse quickens. Anger comes up until it becomes a rage. And then it comes out of her mouth. And she begins to cuss and to swear and to curse the money and whoever took it. That which she loved and cradled, now she curses. She curses the money that has been unfaithful to her and allowed somebody to take it away. She curses the thief that took it. She is screaming. The veins in her neck are bulging. Why did this hap- to happen to me, she proclaims. It's not fair. I've worked so hard. I've been so diligent. Why would God allow this to happen? Frustration, anger, are always reactions to situations and to people that are not doing what you want them to do. You see, your will is not being carried out. Your plans, your desires, your lusts to have something doesn't happen. And your display of anger, it intimidates and controls people. And it controls them into giving in to your way. Just as a child gets the candy that his mother originally said no to, now he gets it by throwing a temper tantrum. And then as you get older the temper tantrums just become more sophisticated and more scary. As her son Micah was within a square mile of the house, he heard her. And he heard her cursing. And then all of a sudden the fear came up in him because he believed in the cursing, you understand. The guilt comes up. So he runs into the house, falls down at his mother's feet, and confesses everything. I took it. And just like that, instead of cussing, now she blesses. Oh, and... What a sudden transformation. One second she's cussing, the next minute she's blessing her son from the Lord. Kind of like an average drive to church on Sunday morning. And it's been one of those kind of mornings. The kids won't cooperate. They won't wake up. They don't eat their cereal. 
Mom's in a bad mood. Yell, scream, it's, we're going to be late. Get in the car. You go out in the car, you blow the horn. And then on the way to church, everybody gets in front of you and drives slow. You idiot! And we go around them and we shake our fists at them and we cut them off and I showed them. And you kids shut up back there. I don't tell me how to drive, woman! And we pull up into the church parking lot. Gravel goes every which way. And we get out of the car. Oh, well, hello, brother. It's so good to see you today. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. One minute cursing, the next minute blessing. That was Micah's mother. That's the environment that Micah grows up in. So, Micah's mother has her God back that she created and that she worked so hard for. And her God is back now under her control. People without the truth of the one true God, they want a higher power in their life. They want a God that will bring them luck and wealth and a good paying job and health and happiness and success and a new car and a nice expensive house with new furniture and new clothes and the latest phone and the latest gadgets and the smartest children and and, and, and. Folks, it's called idolatry. The worship of images. The image on your phone. The image in your mirror. The image on your computer. The image on your television. The image on the CD. The image on the movie screen. The image in the catalog. The image on the billboard. And in the biggest place of all, the image in our mind. And then way, way off in a corner is the Lord. Crowded and choked off. Oh, but when a tragedy hits, you weave your way through the thicket and through the thorns, through the cobwebs and through the dusk, and you ask for the magic of prayer. A blessing. A restoring of the whatever it is you've lost. Your health, your wealth, your job, your relationship, your happiness. That's the only time you look for God is when you need something from Him. And then once you've received something, back to the corner He is relegated to. This is Micah's mother. And it has a profound effect upon Micah. Verse 3. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand, 
for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Folks, be careful of a God that can be stolen. And I notice here that she said the money had been wholly dedicated to the Lord. 1,100 pieces of coins, 1,100 shekels of silver. Wholly dedicated to the Lord. For what? To make an idol? To make a god? Are you kidding me? Folks stick their head up out of their indulgence and possessions and entertainments and pastimes and hobbies and sports and pleasures and sins and they proclaim, Oh, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. And then they submerge right back down into their idolatry. Verse 4, yet he restored the money unto his mother. And his mother took 200. I thought it was 1,100. She took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. You see? She dedicated 1,100 pieces of silver to the Lord, but only gave up 200. And she kept 900. But then the 200 comes back to the house... And she's still, it's still under her control. It's just in a different form than the coins. Now it looks like her late husband. Now it looks like grandma. Or whatever image they carved. Instead of cash, it's a certificate of deposit. You see, her actions are speaking louder than her words. I read in the book of Titus, just before Hebrews and Philemon, in Titus chapter 1 verse 16, it says, They profess that they know God. They make a profession that uh, they belong to God. They're Christian. They profess with their mouth that they know God. But in works, in their actions, they deny Him. In other words, their actions don't match up to what they're saying. Their mouth is blessing. But their actions are creating a curse. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Turned around and going in the opposite direction with no ear for the voice of God. No ear for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. No obedience to the Word of God. Oh, but... I know Him. I'm a Christian. You you say you love the Lord, and He's first in your life. But do you read His Word daily? Do you pray daily? When you had the opportunity, were you always at church? Has this separation grieved you 
Or has it been a relief that you don't have to get up on Sunday morning and go to church? Be honest with yourself. Are you still giving as you always do? Isn't it funny that whenever economic bad times come, guess what's the first thing that gets cut? The giving to missions and the giving to the Lord through His church. Why is all that? Because of verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You see, what's happening is people are being governed by their own will. Now, turn in your Bibles to our text. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 24. Matthew 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters, two bosses, two authorities, two lords, two gods. No man can serve two masters for Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the love of money that 1 Timothy 6 warned of. Literally, mammon is the God of wealth. The Lord here is appealing to our common sense. It's an emphatic statement, both at the beginning and the end of the verse. You cannot! First of all, there's the impossibility of divided love. The impossibility of divided love. You cannot love two masters. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, warns us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the, wor- <clears throat> in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, The pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. You cannot love the world and love God. You cannot love God and love the world. Or the things that are in the world. Or the possessions that are in the world. Or the money that is in the world. You cannot love anything of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. But isn't it amazing how much of the world encroaches into our lives with each new device that comes into our homes, more of the world comes into our home. And as The world comes into our home, it comes into our churches. And as it comes into our homes and in our churches, it eventually comes into our heart. And we find ourselves attached to the things that aren't going to be here tomorrow. We find ourselves, instead of loving God with all of our heart, we love this possession with all of our heart. We love this position. We love this person. 
But you say, no, it's, it's not impossible. You see, preacher, I love my car and I love my house. You can love two things. I, I love my wife and I love my girlfriend. You can love two things. No. It's all one thing that you love. And it's the world. Your will. What you want. It's what's controlling you. It's what determines your choice and your decision. And you... With your mouth, you make it sound so spiritual. I believe the Lord wants me to do this. When in fact, it's what you want to do. And sin. And the love of worldly pleasures. Do you use grace as an excuse? Do you use eternal forgiveness and justification as an excuse for your sin and for your ungodliness and your unrighteousness? You see, worldly pleasure and sin is just a vehicle that the devil uses to steer you away from the Lord and away from His truth. You see, it's impossible to love God and something else. If you love God, you will spiritually love those that are in the world that need salvation. That need a way back to the church and to the Lord's service. Secondly, there's in this verse of verse 24, there's the impossibility of divided service. The impossibility of divided service. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and the world and the wealth and the possessions. You cannot. I see in service to the world a servitude, a slavery, a bondage. Look at people. It seems like the more they have the more unhappy they are. Look at their faces. They're miserable. Versus serving the Lord. Working in the family business. Working in the fishing boat. Fishers of men, evangelism, Uh, working in the upper room, working in the dining hall where the fellowship goes on, working in the carpenter shop where the learning and the discipleship goes on. What a difference between Oh, what's the stock market going to do? Oh, is there going to be anything left of my 401k? Is the Social Security fund going to be solvent when I retire? Miserable. Bondage, slavery. You cannot serve that 
and serve the Lord at the same time. It's impossible. So, who do you serve? Where's your time spent? What are your thoughts on? What do you think about during the day? What do you do during free time? What do you spend your money on? What do you spend your time on? What do you spend your energy on? What do you spend your focus on? That's who you're serving. What do you talk about to other people? Is it sports? Is it your job? Is it your investments? Is it the politics? Is it the events of the day? Or do you talk about the Lord? And then in our verse, not only is there the impossibility of a divided love, the impossibility of a divided service, there's the impossibility of divided masters. You cannot have two final authorities. You cannot serve two masters. Where is your service? Who is it that you're serving? Yourself and the world? Where's your heart? Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. For Micah's mother, it was in that little hiding place set on those silver coins. What's your heart set on? Where's your authority? Is it between those two points? Or is it between these two covers? Joshua 24. Let me close with this. Joshua 24. Joshua in this same area where Micah and his mother live in Mount Ephraim. He gathers the elders and the leaders of Israel together, of the tribes. And in verse 14, he says this, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him. Serve Him in sincerity and in truth. You cannot separate truth and sincerity. Sincerity is not a substitute for truth. And truth without sincerity is just lip service. Serve Him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers, which your mother served on the other side of the flood in Babylon, in Chaldea, in Egypt. And serve the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, then choose you this day whom you will serve. Because you can only serve one. You can't serve both. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, Here's a resolution. Here's a commitment. Here is a promise. Here is a covenant that Joshua makes with the Lord. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. And they said that with the gods in their back pocket on the shelf in their home, on the dashboard of their car. On the TV with John Smith Ministries Incorporated being pumped into their living room and into their minds. God 
God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve these other gods. For the Lord, our God, He it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. There's no we there. They wasn't there. Everybody that was there perished in unbelief. This is their children who saw it and how quickly they forgot. And so as they go into the land that God has promised them, instead of influencing the Canaanites, they allowed the Canaanites to influence them. And instead of introducing them to the truth and to the one true God, they allowed the girls to introduce them to the false worship. And they began to mix in with the culture until we find ourselves in Judges chapter 17. And everybody has their household gods that they serve But somehow in the back of their mind, they're also serving the Lord. But look at their lives. I invite you this morning to look at your life. Honestly, is it peace? Can it be characterized as joy? Is your contentment, is your security found in Him? Or in something of the world. If you lose someone in a relationship, do you have to replace it immediately? Or you can't function? Do you live in constant fear that something's going to happen? Somebody's going to do harm to your person or take and steal your possessions? Whose God are you serving? The God of the Bible? are the gods of this world. I give you the same advice this morning that Joshua gave the children of Israel. Put away. Put away the strange gods. Put away the world. Put away your love and attachment for the world that's choking out your spiritual life or preventing you from having spiritual life. Put it away! And receive. The one true God in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, this morning, oh God, we need You. Lord, we need You all the time. But these days we're especially reminded of just how much. May our faith and our confidence be placed on You. May our authority come from You and Your Word. May our love not be divided. May our service not be divided. May who we submit as our final authority not be divided this morning. But may we wholly give ourselves to You. May we love You with all of our heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And may we serve you with a renewed zeal and fervency and serve you only. Father, I pray for those who've never been born again, who've never received you as Savior. I pray right now that those who are watching, those who are listening, would open their heart and receive you in repentance and in belief. By faith in these words. That if they confessed with their mouth. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And believe in their heart that. You've been raised from the dead. Your word says. They'll be saved. They'll be delivered. They'll be rescued from the eternal penalty of sin. Whosoever shall call. On the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I pray they would call, they would ask you, 
to save them and to forgive them and to be their Savior. I pray for your people this morning. Help us, Lord, to be your people, not just with our conversation, but with our life. Lord, help us to be who you've saved us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to have a song of invitation, a verse, as we always do. Just as I am, I come is the song of invitation. Just exactly in the condition I'm in right now, I come to Jesus Christ in repentance, in prayer, in renewal, in commitment, in doing as Joshua said. In my heart, I'm coming to the Lord right now and putting away the world and my attachment and love for it and for the things of the world. I put it away and I choose, I decide, I commit right now that I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you do that? As Brother Gary comes and stands, you come to the Lord. Kneel down there as we have the prayer altars here at the church. I pray that you'd use your coffee table, use your sofa, use a chair as a prayer altar and get back right with God. What a blessing to be with my church family again. What a blessing it is just to get a small remnant and portion of it here uh, as we record this service with our media ministry. Uh, guys, thank you for your faithfulness, for your service, and uh, the hours that it takes to put this together. Uh, pray for the media ministry that the Lord would continue to bless this uh, that we're doing. Uh, Brother Gary, thank you for coming and being a part of our service today. Church family, keep praying. You have your prayer list before you. And uh, today, with it being Sunday, uh, today would have been our church picnic, our bring a friend fellowship. Uh, and uh, we want to reschedule that and have that again as well as our other services. Our f first service back, as I've been saying, is going to be our Easter service. We're going to have a breakfast at 8 o'clock. Then we'll have a Sunday school. We'll have the children's activities. Uh, then we'll have a morning service and no evening service. And we're just going to celebrate the whole morning uh, being back together. So until, they, until then, uh, we will let you know uh, as the Lord leads and guides. And it's safe for us to meet together again. Uh, continue to pray on Wednesday evenings together as a church family at 7. If you have prayer requests, email them, text them, call them in to me, and we'll make sure that gets on the prayer list. Pray together uh, Wednesday at 7. Worship together as you're doing now, Sunday mornings at 11, so that we can still, although we're in different locations, we're in the same location as a family uh, worshiping together. Uh, serve the Lord with gladness. Uh, I pray that this week that you would use the opportunities 
the unique opportunities that this unusual time brings and that, that you would serve the Lord with all of your heart. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Bro Taylor, come dismiss us, please. Lord bless you, Brother Taylor. Thank you for all your work and labor in the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time we get to spend together. I want to thank you for giving us the ability to continue to record your sermons, Lord, so that we can visit from home, even though it's not the same. Lord, I also want to pray that that as a family, a church family, and personal family, that we Take this time to see how quickly the world does fall apart, Lord, and correct what we uh, need to do in our lives and point our compasses towards you, Lord. And I pray that uh, we can continue to grow closer to you, and I pray that as soon as our church gatherings can resume, that uh, we worship you, Lord, in a way that we haven't in a long time. And I pray that everything your 